Versatile PhD represents the successful transformation of a hobby to a socially positive business. Please join me in welcoming Paula Chambers to the AEG Annual Meeting, Los Angeles. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, really uh, an honor to, uh, to be here at AAG. And I have to say, I have, uh, in the recent months and years, been dealing more and more with professional associations in different disciplines. You guys are so lucky. AAG is, in my opinion, and I'm not alone, a national model for how to provide information to members about the full spectrum of careers that are available for PhD level geographers. AAG is really in the vanguard in this respect. So you guys are lucky. I mean, they provide so much, I even said to them, why do you even need me to come? I mean, you're, <laughs> what can I say that you haven't already said, you know? But they wanted me to come anyway, and so it is a pleasure to be here. And I've also been really excited and interested to learn a little bit about the discipline of geography. This is the first time that I've spoken to a single discipline audience. Usually I speak to a room full of graduate students and postdocs, or maybe humanists and social scientists, and then later STEM, right? I have never spoken to only one discipline before, and so I had to bone up for you guys to make sure I didn't say anything totally stupid about geography. But in the process of that, uh, I found how fascinatingly versatile your discipline is. Geography, I mean, where, the question of where and how has never been more important than it is today. In this era of globalization, where becomes totally non-obvious and totally critical to many businesses, governments, nonprofits, every, in every sector, in every human endeavor, the question of where is becoming more and more important. So you guys are on the cusp of a wave of broad, deep interest in your subject. The same cannot be said for my subject, English. You, cannot, you, you, are, you are doing something that lots of people are interested in for lots of different reasons. So that positions you to really, like your association is a model of promoting versatility, it positions you to yourselves be models of versatility. So what is versatility? Oh, come on, clicker. There we go. To be versatile means to be capable of doing many things competently. Having many uses or serving many functions. And here's a nod to the entomologists who aren't here, but We'll think of them capable. This is a, a term that uh, entomologists use to describe movable antennae on bugs, capable of moving freely in all directions. Right? <laughs> so these, these are what you are. Geography is everywhere. You are capable of doing many things competently. Uh, my own journey towards versatility uh, happened really before I even became an academic because academia was not my first career. I was in the film business and it was kind of an example of versatility, though I wasn't thinking of it that way, for me to leave the academy, I mean leave the film business and enter the academy. So, and I wanted to be a professor like most academics do, like most people who go to grad school either do or start to want once they're in and they see, you know, they get enculturated by what their professors value and what their institution values. So they become like, well, gee, I wasn't thinking, but you know, now I'd like to be a professor. And that, that totally happened to me. And I went, you know, okay, I'm not stopping with the masters like I thought I would. I'm going to go on for the PhD. I'm going to go for the brass ring, right? Not realizing that there were many other rings that I just wasn't even seeing. Right? Many, many other rings that I could have grabbed for. But okay, we, we go through what we go through. I went to the PhD program in rhetoric and composition, was my exact subspecialty of English, if you care. And so the best ret comp program was at Ohio State. And I went there and had a marvelous experience, but learned while I was in grad school that, uh, that there were several good reasons why an academic career was not the best choice for me. It had nothing to do with my intellect. I was plenty smart enough. It was my temperament. 
I am impatient. I am proactive. I am interested in many, many, many things. I'm like an octopus of interests reaching out. And when you're an academic, you have to focus in more narrowly. And I found as I advanced in my studies, the narrowness of my work as I get, I mean, once you start drilling down into the dissertation, man, you're like in Narrowville. And you're, you're, you're doing that one little thing, you know, and hoping that somebody cares. And I realized that, that the only people who would actually read my dissertation, they numbered in the single digits, you know, like eight or nine. And my four committee members, uh, my parents, maybe, um, my, my boyfriend, maybe, and the most inquisitive of my research subjects who had expressed curiosity. And I think she was the only one who actually did other than my dissertation committee. So, and that bothered me. I felt that as my expertise grew, my reading public shrank. And so that was one thing that was, just didn't work for me. I'm not disparaging it. I'm just saying that for me, it wasn't the right temperamental fit. Um, and, uh, and also, I felt that uh, my, my eagerness for, uh, to, to solve problems and solve them now and solve them creatively was not, a right, not the right fit with the stable, stable, rock-like, slow-moving juggernaut of a university. Um, and so I, I predicted, I think correctly, the world will never know, but I think correctly that I would have led a very frustrating life had I been an academic. Beca because I'd be saying like, oh, well, let's change this, let's improve that. And they'd be all going, man, chill out, Paula. We're not going to change anything that fast. And I'd be <laughs> So I felt that. And uh, for those reasons, uh, I decided to leave the academic world. But I did not know what to do instead. Um, I was very fortunate. My two professors were very, very understanding, unlike many in English departments. And so I, I got off scot-free on the shame and ostracism thing, but they didn't know what else I could do. So, and this is now back in the late 90s when there were not a lot of online resources about non-academic careers for PhDs. And so there, there weren't any easy answers available on the web. And, uh, and I just kept thinking, remember, this is the late 90s. I thought, I wish somebody would just create a listserv about humanities uh, PhDs and non-academic careers to create a safe space where that topic could be discussed. Because in the humanities, I mean, I know it's a little bit like this in geography, but it's worse in the humanities. There's a lot of taboo around non-academic careers. It's getting a little better, but generally, there's, it, it's spotty. The improvements are spotty, and there's plenty of places where the old taboo is still very entrenched. And so, so I wanted to create a, sh a safe, shame-free space where that could be discussed. And I was imagining that we humanities grad students would help each other out and exchange information. And then I, I realized that, in fact, they didn't, ha they didn't know either. So I decided to, well then, gee, I'm the owner of this list. Why don't I find people who do know? Because I wasn't an expert. I was just a member of the target population myself. I just wanted this information, and I knew other people did, so I created the space, and it didn't appear magically. So I went out and got it. I started recruiting PhDs uh, in humanities who had left the academy, and having them come onto the listserv and speak in you know, email terms for a week. Um, and so I just kept doing this while I was writing my dissertation. It was a great dissertation procrastination project. <laughs> awesome for that. Right? Like, oh, I don't want to dissertate. Okay, I'll do work for us, which is the name of the listserv. Truthfully, had I known what a big deal the listserv would, would be, had I known that it would grow into the signature accomplishment of my life, I would have put more thought into the name. Work for <laughs> us? It sounds like a blue collar employment agency. You know, you need a ditch dug? Call work for us. Well, anyway, whatever. It, it was just a throwaway. Oh, work for us. Okay. So I was doing the list all these years, and I never imagined that it would be my career. I never imagined what an incredible impact it would make. And that's really key, too. For me, it's, it's maybe different for you. Whatever your thing, your theme is in your quest may be different. For me, a theme of my quest for my whole life has been a quest for impact. I have wanted to have an impact on the world. Now, lots of things can be construed as impact. It, it, there's no objective yardstick. It's what you feel 
makes the right kind of impact that you personally want to make. That's why I left the film business, because I felt this is incredibly stressful, six days a week, 18 hour days, and for what, die hard? You know, I, I didn't feel that the film business just, that the end product, the social impact, I felt it did not justify the incredible amount of effort and stress. So, and, and in the end, I left academia for the same reason, didn't I? Which I didn't even see the theme then. The great benefit of being 50 is that you can look back and see the themes of your life. Whatever your themes are, you don't see them yet, but you will, you will. So, all right, so, I, so even while I was doing work for us and finishing my dissertation, um, I still didn't know that it would be my career. I didn't go, oh, I'm gonna turn this into an innovative, socially positive business that's gonna change academic culture. I didn't, I, 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 would, I mean, if you had said that to me, I would have gone, what? So I thought, well, okay, I, 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 I'm a writing teacher. I'm a ret comp person, so to leave the academy, I have to take what I now believe that I am and export it outside of the academy. So I thought, okay, I'll be a writing teacher outside the academy. Oh, right. I'll be a trainer, a corporate trainer. Yeah, that's it. And corporations will pay me lots of money to teach their employees how to write and how to give oral presentations, and it'll be just awesome. <sighs> Epic fail. Epic fail. I did not realize that I do not share. I don't come from a corporate background. I have no corporate experience or relationships. I have no had no understanding of the profit motive and therefore I was never able to connect with potential clients or to articulate to them why they should hire me in terms that they would understand. All right? I understand why good writing is good. It, it's just good. It's just good, right? Well, no, because to them it would have to increase the bottom line. So I did a total face plant on my consulting business. It, it, 18, I'm lucky I was married and had an income earning spouse because it was just <laughs> And then I thought, uh, then I, I discovered the nonprofit sector. W when I realized, oh, that's why, it's because I don't get the profit motive. And I also had some positive volunteer experiences in a nonprofit organization that made me think, hi, diddle dee dee, the nonprofit sector for me, that's the problem, that's what's wrong. I am not profit focused, I am mission focused. Awesome. So I, I became a grant writer using my rhetoric and composition research and persuasive writing skills, very good fit that way. And uh, for five years, I had a progressively responsible, successful career as a grant writer right here in Los Angeles. I worked for three different organizations. And uh, within, uh, within two, good God, is this true? Yes, within two years of my first job as a grant writer, I had gotten a second job as a director of development. So I, I had what seems now, looking back, a meteoric rise. It did not feel fast at the time, because remember, I'm impatient. I <laughs> It did not feel fast at the time, but I look back, I go, dang. Anyway, that whole time, I kept doing work for us, still not realizing that work for us was my real mission, my real purpose on this earth. I didn't realize it until 2006, when I happened to be invited to speak to a group of career counselors who are specifically graduate student career counselors. Some of you are in, in universities that have graduate career counselors in their staff. Many universities just, their career center just serves undergrads and they don't reach out to you and you're barely aware of them, right? But some universities have a staff person dedicated to helping graduate students in the career center. And so those people, the graduate career counselors, they're really passionate. And they get together once a year. It's only like 60 people. It's a really small group. So they invited me to speak in 2006. And speaking to, the, when I walked into the room, my life changed because it was like, Paul, oh my God, you're Paula Chambers? John, Paul is here. Oh, we love your listserv. We love it. Victoria, Paul is here. Oh my God. I mean, they, they reacted so strongly to me. I mean, when you're doing something online at home, you don't see the faces of the people. You know, I, I'm excited to see you nodding. You know, like, oh, because I've been just dickety 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 on my keyboard. I never knew. I never, and I knew that, sure, listserv subscribership had swollen to 2,500 people by that time, but that's not the same as an in person encounter where I finally uh, understood what an impact I had made 
finally my theme, my quest for impact, had reached its, its conclusion, had reached its climax. And it was kind of a case of like the Wizard of Oz. You've always had the power to go home, you know. <laughs> tick, tick, tick. You've been having an impact all along. And I didn't even realize it. So that was when, that was in 2006, and I, set, I decided at that time, OK, this is what I want to really do. And I was, you know, I blah, blah, logistics of how I got out of fundraising and got into this. So now the end result of all that today is that uh, three years ago in 2010, I converted my hobby, work for us, into a business. I changed the name, thank God, from work for us to the versatile PhD. You know, versatile, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And uh, it's a very empowering name. You know, all, all, all the other things that you see about non-academic careers, even just the word non-academic career, it's defined by what it's not. You know, beyond academe, no longer an academic, ex-academic. How about we find a new identity, right? So, so versatile PhD. It says everything to me. It says everything. So anyway, I changed the name, had to create a business model. Oh my god, long story. Talk to me later. But I figured out premium content subscription service. I couldn't, I had to create a new product to sell to universities, not to grad students. I couldn't take money from grad students, didn't want to. That was never seriously considered. But universities were a reasonable paying client. So I had to create premium content that's even better than the free content that was in the listserv and now on the website. So it's now a, a web-based discussion forum that is still free to all and still mainly humanities social science focused, but I created a STEM discussion forum uh, in October of 2011. So I am expanding to STEM. It's not the versatile humanist. It's not the versatile social scientist. It's the versatile PhD. So I am sort of <laughs> colonizing the other half of the world. And the STEM content will debut in July. This is the versatile PhD homepage. Uh, just a, a quick little look, and then we'll go on and give you more substantive information. But that is a versatile PhD. When you visit the site, you'll see a little carousel of photos there. They're all real. Th these are not stock photos I bought from Getty Images. These are real versatile PhDs at work who gave me their photos to use on the site. And th these are some topics that have been discussed in the Humanities Forum uh, as of the time this screenshot was taken and the subscribing universities. There's like 55 universities now have subscribed to my service. And I just hired two employees, and I can't believe how much it's taking off. I'm stunned and delighted and excited and stressed because I'm like, oh my god, building capacity. So I have these two employees, and it's really great. And uh, this is an example of the premium content. These are, uh, there's four kinds of premium content. This is, in my opinion, the best, most valuable kind. You will not find this anywhere else. Hiring success stories. Each one of these people, this linguist here, Melissa Epstein, each one of these people gave me their resume, their cover letter, that they, these are people who successfully got their first non-academic careers, their first non-academic jobs out of grad school or in some cases out of an early faculty placement. And they shared with me their resume, their cover letter, the job posting they were responding to, their CV for comparison purposes, and they wrote a narrative. They're humanists, so they write real well. Narrative, a success story, describing how they got the job, step by step. And so these, there's 40 of these hiring success stories covering all the humanities and social science disciplines. And I'm hoping to add some geographers soon. So when you guys get your first non-academic jobs, email me and say, I want to write a hiring success story. That'd be great. So that's versatile PhD. Enough about me and versatile PhD. Now let's talk about you. This is the metaphor, a dominant metaphor in the academy for discussing PhD careers. Basically, it's, they, they even speak in some disciplines of a literal, almost literal, pipeline. Right? Supposedly, grad students go in and professors come out. Right? We all know this is a fantasy. We all know that really it's more like this. Right? This is also commonly spoken of in the academy, the leaky pipeline. 
that yes, the, the basic idea is grad students in, professors out, but some students leak out like so much industrial waste. Some students leave their programs. Some students, whatever, couldn't cut it. Most often it's figured in terms of student fault. You know, they left their program, they couldn't cut it, they weren't committed enough, whatever. But uh, at least it's a little closer to reality than the pipeline. Even closer to reality, however, is this. This is what it really looks like. You can see that some, yeah, grad students go in, but lots of different people come out on the other side. Now, this is a generic, <laughs> pipe's not to scale. It's different in different disciplines. It's really actually very interesting. As I've given more of these presentations and been addressing more audiences, I've had to come up with more discipline-specific pipelines. So I'm learning how variable those right-hand emerging pipes are. It's fascinating. But this is the basic concept. Some people become tenure professors or tenure track professors or PIs, some adjunct, and from there be, enter the tenure track or not. Some go right into other careers, that's me, right into other careers, and some do a postdoc and from there join the tenure track pipe or leave into other careers. That is how it really is. This is the science on which that is based. This is a, a, a real scientific study uh, published in 2011 um, that show, it was done at UC San Francisco, which is a graduate school that only has life science. Well, they have a few social scientists, but mostly, vastly, life science. They're kind of a medical type graduate school. And they did a study there of students' desires. And that's an interesting nuance. We're not looking at actual placements here. We're looking at desires. Student desires change around year three of their PhD programs. That they went, they, they go in, wanting to be a professor. Hi, diddle dee dee, the academic life for me. And then around year three, they go, whoa, maybe not so much. Or whoa, maybe this is actually more interesting. Or whoa, I can't live this life. Or whatever it is that they feel for themselves, their, their, I, their goals change in year three. This is what it looks like in the humanities, um, in my discipline. Like some people, here's me, boop, right into other careers. Some people. Very few, only 8% of humanities PhDs go into postdocs, 8%. Um, and some, very small percentage, go into tenure track positions, which everybody wants. The vast majority go become adjuncts. They, they VAP. They visit, they visiting associate profess. And they'll have like a one year VAP or a two or three year VAP. But very few of them actually enter the tenure track stream. Some of them do. Yeah, some of them do. It takes a long time and you have to turn your dis into a book and, and get lucky, right? This is how <laughs> the history, this is just as a different, I, I want to show you disciplines other than your own because you are not just siloed as geographers. Because you are graduate students in PhD programs, you are part of a broader movement than you realize. The same things are happening in all disciplines in different ways with different shadings. But PhD, there, has, there is seldom the same number of jobs, tenure track academic jobs, as there are new PhDs. Wouldn't that be lovely, right? But no, this is in history. You can see the blue line is PhD recipients and the red line is jobs advertised. So there, are, there was this one fabulous period, right? That's in the late 80s when there were more jobs advertised than new PhDs. Woohoo! But you know, how long did that last? Mostly the two lines kind of dance around each other. <coughs> this is the geography pipeline based on statistics that Ken and Michael were gracious enough to help me locate. Um, it's a little impressionistic, but this is, this is about how it is. You guys, look how fat your tenure track pipe is. A lot of you, 48% to be exact, a lot of you get placed in tenure track jobs. That's partly because of what I said earlier, that there's a real need for geography. And the, and the doctoral programs know that. And so they are continuing to keep the tenure track lines open. Uh, but, and some of you, about 14% go into adjunct positions, 10% into postdocs, and something like 25 or 30% into other careers. So that's you. And here's the same graph you saw for history for geography. 
looks at the same idea, right? Same basic idea, ooh, 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 dancing around each other. But in you guys, the trend is upward. You're kind of sort of like the stock market. And in fact, since these times, that was this stops in 2009. Uh, since then, there's been a nice, a nice upsurge. So you're about to get a lot of, but then who knows what might happen after that. The thing about these figures is that it is a mistake, an easy mistake to make, to imagine that when the number of new PhDs is approximately the number of new positions that everybody gets a job. See, because the positions are not fungible. A geographer is not a geographer is not a geographer. There's physical geographers, there's human geographers, there's all these subspecialties within those two gross categories. And the openings are not for geographer any kind. They're for this kind or that kind or that kind or that kind. So this, these jobs are very, the, these graphs are very uh, crude in the sense that they're just numbers of bodies and open positions. No information about types of positions and types of bodies at the same time. Uh, and also, remember that pipeline? Remember how those adjuncts and those postdocs come back into the tenure track pipe? That means that they've been out there. When you graduate and you finish your PhD, they've been turning their dissertations into books. They're like five years out. They've had two VAPs. They've, they've, they, they have a book because their dissertation finally got published by Rutledge. And they have three journal articles and tons more teaching experience than you. And they're applying for those same jobs. So let me ask you, how does this just, we'll pause for just a moment. How does this make you feel? Shout out some adjectives. Oh, I, I used to be pretty cool about it. <laughs> it's, I mean, I, I, and I'm going to take you back. But I adjuncted for two years. He adjuncted for two years. He landed on tenure track. And when you were an adjunct, how did you feel? Over, overworked. Overworked. Underpaid. underpaid underappreciated. underappreciated. Mm -hmm. I'm glad it worked out well for you. How else does this make you feel? Apprehensive. Apprehensive. Mm -hmm. Many people feel about like this. Well, that's one of the messages I, wanna, I want you to get today. You are not the only one. You are part of a national movement, or a national, if not a movement, let's say a phenomenon, a broad-scale social, socioeconomic phenomenon, that there are lots of PhDs and not enough tenure-track jobs to, accom to accommodate them all. But that's not necessarily such horrible, horrible news. Because especially not for you geographers. You have a lot of good news for you. You are not alone, as we just said. PhDs in all disciplines, by the way, not just geography, but especially geography, one of the more versatile disciplines out there, work in all sectors, all sectors of the economy. Demand for graduate degrees is rising more and more. This is according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. The demand, there are more and more jobs being created that require some graduate education. Now, the BLS doesn't identify what kind of jobs those are, right? But there are more, there's more jobs that require a graduate degree. Your desires may change. If anyone is in this room thinking, I really want to be a professor, oh my god, this is terrible news, well, Remember that first graph of the life scientists? And it's been proven in other disciplines too. Your desires will change. Mine did. Your desires may well change. So the self you are now is more alarmed and less excited than the self you will be then when your desires change. Your desires will change for a reason and it will feel exciting to you or at least not like the apocalypse you do have marketable skills, especially you geographers, you're so lucky. And non-academic careers have advantages. This is something I think people in the academy don't appreciate. Yes, academic careers have their own advantages. Yes, if you, especially if you get tenure, awesome, right? Can't beat it for job security, cannot beat it. And the pay is, you know, okay, not great, but not terrible and the supposed summers off, which we know is, is a myth because you have to work your ass off rehearsing all summer, I mean, researching all summer, right? So it's not really, it's not exactly the beard stroking, tweed wearing, pipe smoking leisure that it has been, you know, that people think it is, right? But 
Job security, great. Access to institutional prestige, institutional resources. All right, can't be beat for that. However, non-academic career advantages include the freedom to live wherever you want. Higher income potential. Clearer expectations. This one's a little bit less obvious. In the academy, when you're on the tenure track even, and when you're off, you're you know, laboring to, to show rigor, to show merit. And boy, I have never heard two more subjective terms in my life. Right? The, the people who are going to judge you, the hiring committees who hire you or don't, the tenure and promotion committees who promote you or don't, you have to please them. And it isn't ever really well defined what rigor or merit are. Right? And, so, and nobody helps you plan your time. So it's, it's in many ways, you're in the wilderness in the academy. Whereas in a non-academic job, you have a job description. Here, do that. Much easier. And faster advancement. More variety of tasks and paths available to you. If you have your first non-academic job, maybe you don't like it so much, you think, OK, I'll go do this now. I'll go be versatile. I'll go just do this now. You have, you're more empowered. You have more choices. Whereas once you're a professor, the sort of dark downside of being a tenure track professor, and especially once you get tenure, you can never move. You're there. This is your job for the rest of your life. Like, you're going to be teaching boatload after boatload of students these same classes. Maybe you'll get a new class. Woo! You know, maybe a new, you know, a new prep, or maybe you'll start a new research project. Woo! But basically, you're there. Your life is in that institution, and it's very hard to move once, you ha once you're on the tenure track, because there's much fewer jobs for, for, prof for associate professors than there are for assistant professors, right? So it's harder to move. And the good news for you specifically is that uh, there are the, the BLS uh, predicts 15,000 new geography-related jobs by 2018. Now, most of these jobs don't conveniently have geographer in the title. That's the thing, is that these jobs are hard to find because uh, jobs that require spatial analysis are not always called geographer. Jobs that require your skills are not always like, hey, this is you. Right? So it takes a lot of cognitive effort to identify appropriate positions. Um, but the book Practicing Geography is an awesome help in that regard. Um, and oh yes, I, was I clicking? Um, the ge geographical skills and thinking apply to many, many fields, as I said before. And AAG provides amazing resources. So some. Careers open to geographers. And I should say, in, by way of making you feel like you're part of something larger than your own discipline, that these careers were plucked from my general list of careers that are open to most humanists and social scientists. Right? But these are, this is the sort of geography skewed version of that general list. Lots of other disciplines can go into some of these careers. Cultural resource management, that's a good one for geographers and historians. Science policy, can, can you guys in the back read the print on the screen? Okay, good, then I don't have to read this out loud. Nonprofits and think tanks, that's at the bottom, you can't see that. You'll get all this, by the way. I understand AAG is collecting email addresses, and uh, if you give them your email address, you will receive a, uh, a PDF version of this PowerPoint presentation and a list of resources that are applicable to both graduate students and faculty members. I know there's some faculty in here, so you will, you will be well served by the uh, handout will be mailed to you. So be sure to give Ken or Michael your email address. Market research, program evaluation, instructional design, environmental law, research administration, management consulting, entrepreneurship, and on and on and on. Here are some skills that most PhDs have. Once, they, once you've been through five, six years of a PhD program, you pretty much you can do primary research in your discipline. You can also do secondary research. You know how to assemble existing sources and make a report about something or other. You're a quick learner. You know how to identify and retrieve information that already exists. That's very important in the non-academic world. You have your subject matter knowledge. You have critical thinking, analytical skills. 
you have written and oral communication skills, you, have, you are a rapid learner, you can design instructional experiences in a variety of media, and you can assess and evaluate, particularly assess and evaluate learning and quality of research, but also by extension other things. Last year, the Council of Graduate Schools did a report called Pathways Through Graduate School and Into Careers. And it, they talked with employers about PhDs and said, employers, what do you think PhDs need more of? And this is what the employers said, teamwork, time and project management, creating and delivering oral presentations, delivering outcomes on time and on budget, and communicating with lay audiences. So these are some suggestions for you to choose experiences while you're in grad school that will build up these skills in you. Choose a service project that has a budgetary component. Choose a service project that requires you to communicate something to a lay audience. Opt for these things. Include them. And then you'll be able to say, well, I've done this and I've done that. Uh, these are skills that uh, Michael and Kenneth and Janet uh, identified that geographers need outside the academy. Field methods, definitely don't skimp on those. Computers and digital media, any digital skills you can get is to the good. Interdisciplinarity itself is a versatile way of being. If you are able to collaborate with people who have different knowledge bases and even different cultural backgrounds than your own, then you will succeed in the non-academic world. It's very, very, very important. And geographical analysis variously applied. If you can think of your, your analytical techniques, the methods you know best, and if you can free your mind from thinking that they're just for geography, as you know it, and think, well, gee, what else could I, gee, I could, I could apply this to understanding why my daughter's bedroom always looks the way it is. I can apply this to this or that. Just be really wild. Think outside the box of what your skills can do, and that will help you appreciate the versatility that you already have. So how to prepare. And let me say again, this is, I, I'm not coming to you with a message that you're never going to get an academic job, you're hosed, you have to prepare for a non-academic job because the good jobs are not numerous enough for you. That's not the message. That's more the message that I say to humanists because that's more true in humanities. But it's not, you know, 48% of you go into tenure track jobs, right? So this is not a, not a you know, be afraid, be very afraid presentation. This is, you have exciting possibilities. The reason AAG brought me here is because they wanted me to underscore their message to you that while ge geography doctoral programs are still rooted in some older assumptions and have been slow to change, and while geography doctoral students absorb that atmosphere and come to believe, as I did in the humanities, that only an academic career, that I want an academic career, because that's what everybody else around me wanted. You know, yes, I want an academic career. Uh, they wanted me to share with you that the reason why geographers need to be more versatile is not because of a lack of academic jobs, but an abundance of non-academic jobs. Non because of this globalization thing, geography, geographers, geographical skills and methods are needed in so many more sectors that you have more possibilities than you realize. So to prepare for these possibilities, use the available resources to you. That means your, your, your university, find out if they have a graduate career counselor. Maybe they do and you don't know it. Or maybe they don't. OK, then you found that out. You tried that. And try use AAG. Explore online communities like Versatile PhD, for example. Observe your feelings while doing stuff. I remember when I was dissertating and doing work for us, it was like, oh God, I guess I'd better write on my dissertation. Or, okay, now, okay, I'll do work for us now. Bounce, 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 bounce. It's, uh, that's how I felt inside. And that was a clue to me. So watch whatever your mix of activities is in your current life. Observe your feelings while you're doing them. Observe what makes you feel like your tail's wagging. 
yeah, I want to do more of this. And what makes you feel like, oh, God, I have to do this. I'm so bad for not doing this, you know? Watch what you procrastinate with. A different way of saying the same point, really. I was procrastinating with, versatile P with work for us, which now has become versatile PhD. That was a huge clue. Did I, did I hear the message at the time? No, but that's OK. It's all right. I had to go through my evolution, and you do too. But watch what you procrastinate with. And use your service time to build needed skills. Being in the academy, being a grad student, it, it certainly has its, its downsides, you know, the saltine and peanut butter meals. But it, the upside is that you are in a, an institution. You are in a, a, a kind of a bubble, an economic sheltered bubble, where you are able to avail yourself of resources in your, in your institution and outside your institution. And you are expected to do a certain amount of service, right? Not just take your classes, do your homework, and you're done. It's, that's school. This is you know, doctoral education. And you're expected to emulate a faculty member. And faculty members do service. So you can strategically select your service assignments to build those skills that you need. You can get a part-time job or a volunteer gig. And here's, here's something that very few people are saying. Keep records of everything with numbers. By that I mean when you teach a class, count the students. Count the number of assignments you give them. Count the number of drafts that you read. I'm thinking composition teacher, right? I don't know what your classes are that you teach. But whatever you do, count it. Count your seminar papers. Count how many of this and that that you do. Because that allows you to write resume bullets like this. Wrote 24 research reports using information from diverse print and online sources. Designed 14 multimedia geography lessons for students. Isn't that better than my responsibility was to design lessons? <laughs> right? With a number, it sounds like more of an accomplishment. Directed external communications for Grad Student Labor Union. Built one website, wrote eight press releases, raised profile in four social media platforms. Counting, counting. And if you think you'll remember later on, you won't. Write it down now while you're doing it, because I swear to God, you won't remember. I didn't. I went to write my resume at the end of the PhD. I was like, gee, what did I do for these last five years? I have no freaking clue. OK, created and delivered five PowerPoint presentations to lay audiences eh, 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 about Smoky Mountains topography, or whatever your subject might be. You can find these opportunities. You know, Toastmasters, Rotary Club, Kiwanis, they're always looking for a lunchtime speaker. Scheduled and coordinated five team projects. She's a team player, right? Com completed all five on time and on budget. Right? So seek out these experiences and then count the countables of whatever it is you're doing, because it'll make it so much easier for you when you write your resume later on. Aspiring Academics, a book put, a book put out by AAG uh, about academic careers in geography. It's important because that is part of the full spectrum of careers that, that are open to you, especially for you as geographers. 48% of you will get that career, so definitely look at that. And Practicing Geography, fantastic book by these two guys and Janice Monk, who's not here, um, and, the, uh, and the AAG website. I mean, you, you have a cornucopia in the AAG. Most other students in other disciplines don't have that. Their, their discipline says, you know, wah, 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 wah. We support non-academic careers, too. Oh, yeah? How? Well, uh, <laughs> so AAG really, really does. It really puts its money where its mouth is. So you are versatile. You have a lot of exciting careers to look forward to. And as geographers, you have an increasingly important role to play in the world, in the world figuring itself out in the era of globalization. Thank you for listening to me for an hour. <laughs> and I'd like to encourage you to ask questions. And, I, uh, and, and once the questions are fully addressed, then there's another little activity I have for you. <laughs> questions, anyone? Yes, ma'am. 
She said that she's, uh, she's on the job market now, on the non-academic job market. She has her PhD. She has some experience, but the job uh, postings are calling for this, that, and that experience. And how can she package herself and sell herself for a non-academic job? The key is to look to mine your academic experience for non-academic-ish experience in there. Like these service projects that I mentioned, if you served on a committee or something, think in terms of the results that you achieved. Uh, think in, in, in terms of, you know, worked successfully to revise a controversial student manual for my doctoral program or whatever the heck you did. Uh, remember that and mine it for non-academic-ish experiences. And even teaching can be spun as management of others, certainly as instructional design, as assessment evaluation, as, uh, as project management. You know, even these things can be spun non-academically. More questions? One of the resources that you wanted to expand uh, through the EDGE project is our Jobs and Careers website on the AAG's homepage. If you can find it by going over to on the main menu bar, jobs and careers. And I just want to point out, uh, if you're in a, that position, I'm uh, oh, sorry, what's your name? Jessica. Jessica. If you're in a position like Jessica where you're just trying to establish the landscape and survey the landscape about of what are the career opportunities available to geographers. Well, as Paula mentioned, most positions that geographers take don't carry that job title geographer. Uh, but if you, so if you, one of the ways to get started is looking at what are the range of occupations where geographers are employed. You can, you can do that, one of the ways you can do that is on this site. You go over into the About Geography Careers, okay? And then you get into what geographers do. You see this listing of specialty areas within geography. If you click on any of those, you'll get a sampling of job titles, right? Where ec people of expertise in economic geography can find employment. Cultural geography, right? There's some examples there. So one way of narrowing down that USA job site or any other jobs data bank is find sample occupation titles right in your area of interest in geography and then and then do research on those um, another thing another resource that I think would be uh, illust illustrative for you is under these profiles of geographers in both the book Practicing Geography, and on the AAG website, we have, we've interviewed, uh, oh, I don't know, 60, 70 different professional geographers. And in their profiles, they talk about not just how they are practicing and applying the geographic abilities, but they're also talking about what other skill areas they have found to be important, such as the transferable soft well, their soft skills of communication and management, finance, writing, project management. These are all critically important areas in these different sectors, right? And they talk about, you know, the types of skills that they're using in addition to their geography abilities. And it also gets into other issues about work-life balance, professional ethics, other professional issues that uh, you're going to encounter at various stages of your career. Um, so the, I think these profiles are um, very, pretty compelling resources. And, and we've took a lot of pains to make sure that we're representing the breadth of geography. We have GIS specialists, but we have cultural geographers, economic geographers, environmental geographers, of all different demographic backgrounds at all different career stages bachelor degree holders, master degree holders, and PhD degree holders, right? So these are just resources that are out there just to help you uh, inform yourself about opportunities and how to prepare for them. My pleasure, yes, sir. A couple questions, practicing geography.
bibliography available here at the, uh, yeah. available downstairs? It's up on the AAG booth. Oh, okay. Practicing geography available in the AAG booth in the exhibit hall. And it's, uh, we, we got it off a discount, so if you, if you want to purchase it, purchase it here, but you'll get the discount for it. Here, here at the conference? Yeah. Yeah. Good price here at the conference. I'm, I'm translating for the back row. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. If, uh, if you're considering uh, becoming a consultant, mm -hmm. are the resources available for folks, you know, seeking to jump into this? Somebody who maybe doesn't have a business background. You know, how do, how do you how do you market yourself? How do you mm -hmm. how do you determine how much you charge somebody for your services? Mm -hmm, um, not very specific to geography. I'm sure that there are uh, geographical skilled uh, consultants out there. I mean, there's, there's different kinds of consulting. See, consulting really means, all it really means is something so basic that it's almost meaningless. It means that you are not an employee of an organization, but they are paying you to do something specific for them. So you are, so that could mean you could be a geographer being a consultant on, uh, on, uh, on, it's like spatial analysis or something, geography. Or you could be a management consulting he uh, consultant helping a business figure out what's going wrong and why they're bleeding money there and what they need to change in order to be more efficient or whatever it is, right? So there's different kinds of consulting. Are you talking about subject matter consulting, geography consulting, or are you talking about management consulting, something more general? Related ge to geography. Geography related, okay. There are, on, on Versatile PhD, there are, uh, when STEM content debuts um, this uh, July, there will be some examples of scientific consultants, PhDs who left their science field to go, like say an engineer goes to work as a consultant in an engineering consulting firm, or a hydrologist becomes a hydrologist consultant in, an in the hy hydrology consulting firm. There are a lot of consulting firms that do very specific things, including most likely geography. I would start Googling and I would find what are the companies that, that do, that provide geographical services on a you know, consulting basis and maybe do information interviews with those people. Uh, that would be a really good start. Information interviews are a great tactic and many people don't know about it, but you simply identify a person that you would like to download information from their brain and you email them or you call them up and you say, um, Hi, I'm, I'm Paula Chambers from Ohio State University and I'm in my third year of my PhD program and I'm really interested in your career and I wonder if you would let me come in and, and ask you questions for half an hour about what you do. Right? People love talking about themselves. Are you kidding? This is not an imposition. It's like, you want to talk to me? People love it. They love it. You're not asking for a favor. I mean, you kind of are, but they're usually happy to give it. You'll, you'll get some no's. But you'll get a lot of yeses too. So information interviews, a great technique. Find what you want and go interview it. Yeah. Yes? Great book. So what are you going to do with that by Sue Basala and Maggie DeBalius? Fabulous book. Enormously helpful. Oriented towards humanists. Eh, don't, don't, don't let that stop you. Fabulous book. Fabulous book. Yeah, it's, it comes up often on Versatile PhD. People say, oh, this book is so awesome. I'm jealous. It's so awesome. And she what? And cheap. Yeah, and cheap too. It's a book. It's a book. Yeah. Yeah, books are great. Other questions? Yes, sir. Pay attention to how you feel while you're doing stuff. Say more about that? Yeah, yeah sure, wow. Um, whenever you're doing what you're doing, notice which, which activities you're, you very readily commit to. I mean, really, if you think about it, I, I have heard it said, and I think it's quite true, that the way to really understand a person is to look at their date book and their checkbook. Because that's, where, that's how they spend their time and their money. And really, those are the two most precious resources that we have in terms of the resources that are limited, you know, time and money. We all have the same weensy beansy 24 hours every day. We all have whatever money we have. And how you spend your time and money is a revealing testament 
to who you are, or at least who you have been up till that time. So you could, if you are of a slightly scientific, data-driven bent of mind, you could go look at whatever your calendar is, your method, if you paper or online or whatever it is, look at that and do a little analysis of how do I spend my time? How many, I mean, you have seven times 24 hours per week. How many hours do I spend doing this and that and this and that? Right, so that'll be a really interesting sort of baseline for you to see, to take a snapshot of where your time goes now and be real honest, you know, yeah, and I spend three hours a night watching reality TV or whatever, you know, be really mercilessly honest with yourself. And, and so then you'll see what your activity range is. And then while you go through those activities, say, okay, so, so you've done that. So phase one is done. Now you're going, okay, I'm going to observe my feelings and observe which things I, I skip on my way to doing and which things I have to drag myself, which things I feel like I'm you know, not really liking this. And there's lots of reasons for not liking something. It could just be that it's big. That's part of the dissertation dread. It's like, oh, it's just so daunting. So of course, you'd rather do something that's small and easy, you know, make lasagna, than write a dissertation. So there is that, and you can't blame the disc for that. But, you know, there are things that just feel what you feel, and just, just try to cultivate a habit of self-awareness. And just keep a little bit of a journal about what you feel during different activities. There, there, there will be nuggets of information for you in that. Okay, so here's a little activity. Now, each of you will take a couple of minutes and write down things that you would like to do in order to expand your own mind about non-academic geography jobs. Things you're curious about, questions you have, a couple of minutes of that, and then you'll get another instruction. Okay, so you have your little list. Now, turn to someone near you. You could be in twos or threes or however the seating is already configured and share your ideas with each other. And if you wanted to, if you're really ready to get serious about this, you can, this is a little radical, I know, exchange email addresses with that person and promise to email each other in two weeks and ask, have you done that one thing you decided to do? Don't imagine that you have to make the decision first before you can do anything. You can prepare for all careers simultaneously, especially if you're clever about it, you can choose assignments and activities that will support either path while you're figuring it out. Great idea. What else is somebody doing? I always had in the back of my head that what I want to do is to write a non-academic book. So mm -hmm. I'm going to write a, the outline of that book. He's going to write an outline for his non-academic book. Awesome. When I founded Work For Us in 1999, when I was a grad student, I imagined, even though my advisors were very, I had two co-advisors, they were lovely people. I still, was, I still thought that basically faculty are kind of, to put it in an oversimplified way, kind of the bad guys. That they are the ones who tell us only an academic career will do, and you know, they transmit that cultural message. And okay, some of them are you know, that way, but many of them just don't know what else to do. They haven't been outside the academy. They're academics. They don't know about non-academic careers. Now, some of them, there's a full spectrum among faculty and how they feel about that fact. Some of them do feel like, well, I don't know, and I don't want to know, and I don't want my students to know either. And OK, those are the ones that fit the sort of Simon Legree stereotype of the evil faculty member. But many of them are just, well, I would honestly like to know because I believe that other careers have value in the world, hello, and I want to help my students. And, you know, and there's many positions in between. So, so try to not demonize faculty in your mind. And I'm really happy that there are some faculty members here. So thank you for coming. But with the help of AAG, you just say, here, go here, read this, do that, done. Because you faculty don't have to be experts in non-academic careers. They don't have to know, oh, well, you, you need to apply for these jobs, and you need to apply for 
They, they, they don't have to know that. They can't know that. It's too far outside their experience. What they have to know is how to make good referrals, how to send students to the right information, for sure. What else is somebody going to do? Yes? Mm -hmm. So, you know, things that would provide help for me to get better information into something like BIRD or Locally would, would also normally make the, the decision to help the students to make the call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. These are all great action steps. Now, have any of you actually exchanged email addresses and are you going to hold, hold each other a little bit accountable in a couple of weeks? Did that happen? Let's make that happen now. I'm just going to push this. I'm going to push this. Make that happen now if you're willing. I'm not going to force anyone. Well, guys, at this point, um, we still have time left in the session. I think, it's, uh, I think we have 15 minutes left. I'm just going to park myself here. If anybody wants to talk to me personally, by all means, come up. Or you can continue talking to each other. Or you can skedaddle to your next, to your next scene in this conference drama. But thank you for being here and for staying all the way to the end. <laughs>